Word. All right, so we are going to continue to work through lecture set number 10. Lecture set number 10 is um, devoted to studying two chi-square tests, the chi-square goodness of fit test and the chi-square independence test. On Thursday, we started talking about the chi-square goodness of fit test. Um, and we started to look at an example of how it works, but we haven't actually progressed through all the steps of the test yet via illustration. So as a, re as a reminder, a chi-square goodness of fit test is a hypothesis test. So it's carried out in the same six steps as the other hypothesis tests that we have seen in the class. The chi-square goodness of fit test is used to determine if data, in particular count data, has or um, discrete quantitative data, adheres to a particular pattern. So the purpose of this test is basically to answer the question, does, um, well, does the distribution of the data follow what it is supposed to follow given the sample that we have collected. Like any other hypothesis test, this test has a, a set of assumptions that are associated with it. What's nice about these assumptions is that they're very easy to work out. They're all just based off of calculation from the data that we are working with. The only exception is um, the third assumption, which is the SRS assumption, but we have seen this quite often throughout our illustration so far. Okay, so to better understand when we would use a chi-square goodness of fit test and how it works, we're gonna look at the illustration on slide number nine. So this is our first example. In this example, we have um, a pre-established or known distribution for the colors of M&Ms. So we are told, or um, it is reported that every bag of M&Ms should be 30% brown, 20% yellow, 20% red, 10% orange, 10% green, 10% blue. So that's the distribution of the data. So our data here are these colors of M&Ms. So we wanna test whether or not this is true. So is it true that if we purchase bags of M&Ms, 30% of them will be brown, 20% yellow, 20% red, et cetera. So to answer the question, we buy three bags of M&Ms. We pour the M&Ms out on the table and we count how many of each color we have. Okay, so we have 152 brown, 114 yellow, 106 red, 51 orange, 43 green, 43 blue, and a total sample size of 509. All right, so does this sample of 509 M&Ms give evidence that the color distribution that's reported by the company is um, correct? So to, do, to answer this question, we're going to use a chi-square goodness of fit test. So the goodness of fit test is specifically designed to answer this type of question. So before we start the test, the first thing that we're going to do is compute the expected quantities or the expected values. We need the expected values to compute the test statistic. And we also need them to check the assumptions of the test. So the first two assumptions are based off of the expected quantities. All right, so the way that our expected quantity calculation works is we take our sample size and we multiply by the pre-established distribution for each of the different outcomes. So basically all an expected value is, is the number of each outcome you would expect or um, should occur if the distribution that has been pre-established is true. So for example, 
if we have 509 M&Ms in our sample, we would expect 152.7, which is 30% of them to be brown, right? Because if 30% of the bags are brown and you have 509 M&Ms, 30% of those 509 should be brown if that pre-established distribution is true. So that gives us 152.7. We would expect 20% to be yellow, 20% to be red. So 509 times 0 0.2 is 101.8. So we would expect 101.8 yellow, 101.8 red. Orange, green, and blue should occur 10% of the time. So of the 509 M&Ms, we would expect 50.9 to be orange, 50.9 to be green, and 50.9 to be blue. Okay, so all we're doing to compute the expected value is taking sample size and multiplying by the probability of observing each outcome. <clears throat> now you'll notice that the expected values, they sum to the sample size as well. So this is a way that you can check to make sure you've done the calculation correctly because your when you multiply the sample size by each of the probabilities, since the probabilities have to sum to 100, the expected counts will sum to the sample size. So that's a, built of a, a bit of a built-in check to make sure you're doing the calculation correctly. Okay, the three assumptions of the test. So our first assumption is that all expected frequencies are greater than one. So in this case, our lowest expected frequency is 50.9. This is bigger than one. Therefore, all of the expected frequencies are greater than one. The second assumption is that no more than 20% of the expected frequencies are less than five. Okay, so what this means is that you would count or you have to determine what 20% of the number of different outcomes is equal to. So we have six different outcomes in this particular data set, brown, yellow, red, orange, green, and blue. We expect that 20% of the six outcomes is going to be greater than five in terms of the expected value. Now in this situation, you can see that Again, the lowest expected quantity is 50.9. So that means that 0% of the expected quantities are less than five because we do not have a single expected value less than five in this particular situation. So that means that this um, assumption is also checked off. The last assumption is simply that a simple random sample was collected. So I think... Uh, suppose three randomly sampled bags of M&Ms are given. Okay, so we're just going to assume that this is true. We sampled the bags randomly, for example. Okay, so with the assumptions checked off, we can move into the hypothesis test. So the hypothesis test is composed of six steps. On the first step, we state our null and alternative hypothesis. The null hypothesis is simply that the data follow the pre-established distribution. So in our situation, it would basically just be the data follow the distribution stated by M&M &M and Mars, or you could also write this as 30% um, brown, 20% yellow, 20% red, 10% orange, 10% green, 10% blue. The point being that the null hypothesis for the goodness of fit test is simply reiterating that the distribution of interest is the true distribution. So in this situation, it would basically just be reiterating that all M&Ms are going to occur in frequencies or in proportions of 30% brown, 20% yellow, 20% red, 10% orange, 10% green, 10% blue. So we just want to highlight that. In the alternative, we're just saying that this isn't the case. 
So the alternative alternative is basically stating that this pre these pre-established proportions are not the true proportions. So the data or the color distribution actually follows some other type of um, where the proportion of colors actually occur in different rates than what we have established here. Okay. Step two, we state the, um, the significance level. So in this case, we're using a 5% level. Any questions so far? Okay, on step three, we compute our test statistic. For both chi-square tests, the form of the test statistic is exactly the same. Observed minus expected squared divided by expected. So this is consistent for both tests. So here we have, um, we're gonna take the observed value, match it to its expected value, and then just plug into this particular formula, right? So for example, the first quantity here, this is for the brown M&Ms. The second quantity is for the yellow. The third quantity is for the red. And then orange, green, blue, right? Orange, green, blue. So for the brown M&Ms, we had an observed quantity of 152, an expected quantity of 152.7. So you can see we have 152 minus 152.7 squared divided by 152.7. Plus, then for the next outcome, the yellow ones, we have 114 minus 101.8 squared divided by 101.8. So we're just taking the observed, matching it to its expected, subtract, square, divide by, the expected. So that's our process for this um, calculation. Okay, so once we have our test statistic, which is again just found by filling out this formula, we then take either the critical value or the p-value approach. If we take the critical value approach, okay, we start by sketching out our chi-square curve. So remember that the chi-square curve is a right skewed curve. The process that we use to find the critical and the p-value is going to be very similar to what we did for the t-table. But the chi-square distribution is not symmetric about zero. It's right skewed with a lower bound of zero. So our sketch is going to be something like this, where we have zero at the lowest point, and then we skew out to the right from zero. With the chi-square tests, there's no concept of being double-sided. We're only testing in the skewed tail. So we're going to mark here chi-square. This is going to be on 0 0.05, which is the significance level. Right. So this thing is a size 0 0.05. Okay. And then our degrees of freedom is the number of outcomes minus one. So this is not number, or this is not sample size minus one. It's the number of different outcomes in the distribution minus one. So for us, that's gonna be six minus one because we have six colors. So six minus one, which is five, okay? So to find the critical value, we then go to the chi-square table. And just like with a t-table, we're going to match our significance level to our degrees of freedom. So we have chi-square subscript 0 0.05, 5 degrees of freedom. That gives us a critical value of 11.070. All right, any questions? Okay. 
All right, and then we can place down where our test statistic is going to be. So that's going to be right about here. So you can see that the test statistic is not getting into that critical region. So we're not going to reject the null. If we take the p-value approach, Okay, so we start by sketching our curve again. We mark down where our test statistic is. Okay, the p value is going to be the area to the right of the test statistic, right? So there's no concept of being double sided. We're always in the skew tail. So we're always, in the case of chi square test, going to be the area to the right of the test statistic. So we have p value is equal to the probability that a chi square is greater than 4.09. Okay. So now we go back to our chi square table. So we have two pages to the chi square table. On page one, we have the same degree of freedom. So remember, the chi-square table is read left to right. A t-table is, is read like up to down. The chi-square table is read left to right. So we start on the uh, left-hand side. We start at our five degree of freedom number. And now we're just applying the same technique that we had with the uh, t-table. So our test statistic is 4.09. So as we scroll across this line, you can see that we the highest value we have is 1.610. Now, imagining that we're continuing across the page, you can then see that the next value is 9.236. So our test statistic is in between 9.236 Oh, sorry. Our test statistic is in between 9.236 and 1.610. Okay, because again, we're thinking of this as a left to right object. So we're in between 1.610 and 9.236. So our p value is going to be between 0 0.1 and 0 0.9. So it's the exact same technique as with the t-table, but we can write down more precise ranges because of the structure of the table and how we read from left to right across the degree of freedom row. So that means that we can say since 0 0.1 is less than the probability of interest, is less than 0 0.9, then 0 0.1 is less than the p-value is less than 0 0.9. So our p-value is between 0 0.1 and 0 0.9. Our significance level is 0 0.05. Therefore, the p-value is bigger than alpha, so we do not reject. So on step five, based off either approach, we're not going to reject the null hypothesis. So therefore we can conclude on step six and say at the 5% significance level, the data do not provide sufficient evidence that a standard bag of M&Ms does not follow the color distribution stated by M&M and Mars. That is to say that at the 5% significance level, 
the data do not provide sufficient evidence that bags of M&Ms are not going to occur in proportions of 30% brown, 20% orange, 20% yeah, no, 20% yellow, 20% red, 10% orange, 10% green, 10% blue. So there's no evidence that this is not the distribution of colors for M&M chocolates. Okay, so that is a goodness of fit test. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, so what we're going to do now is look at a second example of a goodness of fit test, and then we'll do the same uh, thing with the chi-square independence test. So we'll look at an example, and then we'll work through an exercise. So we're going to have two illustrations of both types of tests from lecture set 10. Okay, so a goodness of fit test exercise. If two evenly matched baseball teams meet in the World Series, then the probability that the World Series should last four, five, six, or seven games is as follows. 12.5% of the games will last four games. 25% of the series, um, sorry, will last five, will last five games. 31.25% of the series will last six games, and 31.25% of the series will last seven games. As of November 2013, no, this is not correct. As of November 1913, um, and this would have been taken 105 years after 1913, so this is a little bit outdated at this point, but Anyways, as of November 1913, the number of games played in the World Series are 21, 24, 24, 36 for a sample size of 105. Suppose that we can consider this an SRS. At the 5% significance level, do the data provide sufficient evidence to conclude that the World Series opponents are evenly matched? So basically, what we're trying to do here is determine if this sample of World Series gives us evidence that World Series do not occur or that the number of World Series games played will not be four 12.5% of the time or will not be five 25% of the time or will not be six 31.25% of the time or will not be seven 31.25% of the time. Okay, so this is the goal. It's the same idea as before. We're basically just testing to see if the evidence gives or if the data gives evidence that the proportion of games played differs from what is stated in the first table here. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is compute our expected values. So we have um, four, five, six, and seven games played. Our sample size is 105. Okay, so the first expected value is going to be 105 times 0 0.125 because we are told that 12 or 0.125 percent of the games last or of the world series last four games okay so that gives us 13.1250 okay and then for five games world series it's 0 point it, uh, 0.25 times 105 so that gives us 26.25. And then for six and seven game World Series, we have 0 0.3125 times 105 and 0 0.3125 times 105. Okay, so that's the same calculation. And that gives us 38 point, or sorry, 32.8125. Okay, so sample size minus the probability multiplied by the probability of the outcome. All right. The first assumption 
is that no expected frequency is less than one. Okay, so this is verified. Since no count is less than 13.1250. The second assumption is that no more than 5% of the count, or no more than 20% um, of the counts are less than five. This again is verified since no count is less than 13.1250, right? And then the last assumption is that we collected an SRS, which is again verified uh, from description, because we're told that we can consider this data to be a, an SRS. Right. Any questions so far? Okay, so our null hypothesis is that the data follow the pre-established distribution. The alternative is that the data do not follow the pre-established distribution. So there's a lot of ways that we can phrase this. We could just say, for example, the null hypothesis is that 12.5% um, of World Series should be four games, 25% of World Series should be five games, 31.25% of World Series should be six games, and 31.25% of World Series should be seven games. That is a perfectly valid explanation. We can also write, for example, World Series are evenly matched because we are told if the games occur in this number, in this distribution, this is considered evenly matched World Series. Right? So there's a lot of ways that we can phrase this. We could also just say, the um, number of World Series games played follow the pre-established distribution versus the alternative that the number of World Series games played do not follow the pre-established distribution. That would also be perfectly acceptable. The point is just that we want to communicate that the null is that the pre-established distribution is true against the alternative that the pre-established distribution is not true. So that's H0 and HA. And then on step two, we have our significance level, which is 0 0.05. Okay. Okay. On step three, we're going to compute our test statistic. All right. So we're going to, to go observed minus expected squared over expected. So from the table, we have 21 minus 13.125 squared. Divided by 13.125. Plus 24 minus 26.25 squared divided by 26.25. Plus 24 minus 32.8125 squared divided by 32.8125 plus 36 minus 32.8125 squared divided by 32.8125. Okay, and that's going to give us um seven point five nine four right so our test statistic here is seven point five nine four and just remember you just want to do each of these individually when you're working them out
Okay, so now on step four, we're going to take the critical value approach, or we can take a p-value approach. So we are going to be testing at the 5% significance level. Our degree of freedom in this case is the number of outcomes minus one, not sample size minus one. So C minus one, which is equal to four minus one, because we have four different outcomes, four, five, six, seven game series, which is equal to three. So our critical value is on 0 0.05 and three degrees of freedom. Okay, so we go to our chi-square table. We go three degrees of freedom, 0 0.05, and that gives us 7.815. So we have x squared is 7.594. Okay, so we can see that this does not get into the rejection region, so we would not reject. Okay, if we took the p-value approach, So we would mark down where the test statistic is. All right, so here the p-value is the probability that a chi-square is greater than 7.594. So we go back to our chi-square table. We have three degrees of freedom. We can see that 7.594 actually fits directly on the second page. So we're in between these two quantities here. So in this case, we can say, since the probability of, uh, that a chi-square is greater than 7.594 is between 0 0.05 and 0 0.1, p-value is between 0 0.05 and 0 All right. So then it doesn't matter which approach you take based off either the critical value or the p-value approach. It's clear we're not going to reject H0. For the critical value approach, we don't get into the rejection region. For the p-value approach, everything in that range is bigger than 0 0.05. So then on step six, at the 5% significance level, the data do not provide sufficient evidence to suggest that world series Components are not evenly matched.
All right. Good stuff. Any questions? Right. Okay, so now what we're going to do is introduce the second type of chi-square test. So we have two chi-square tests. The first test was called the goodness of fit test, and we just went through two illustrations of the goodness of fit test. So the chi-square goodness of fit test can also be thought of as the chi-square test for one um, qualitative variable. Earlier in the lecture, I said quantitative discrete. That was incorrect. It's one qualitative variable. In the first illustration, our qualitative variable was the color of M&Ms. In the second illustration, I suppose you can think of it as quantitative discrete because it's four, five, six, or seven, but you could also think of those as categories of the number of games played. So we could think of that as qualitative as well, based off of how it's being used. But the point is the chi-square goodness of fit test is our test for one variable when the variable can be thought of as qualitative or used in a qualitative sense. The chi-square independence test, which is the second chi-square test, this is the chi-square test for two qualitative variables. Now, what's nice about the chi-square independence test is that the data four chi-square independence tests will always be in the form of a two-way contingency table. So whenever we see a two-way contingency table, we can automatically start to think this question might require me to use a chi-square independence test. Okay, so for example, suppose that we have um, a vendor or like a business that's selling us circuit card assemblies. It's a very um, interesting example. <laughs> so we have these vendors or these businesses that we're calling A and B, so as to not incriminate any actual vendors or businesses that um, operate in this area. They're selling these circuit card assemblies. And the circuit cards, the CCAs, they can have three different levels of non-conformity. So they can have no non-conformity, which would be none. They can have a minor non-conformity, which we call minor, or they can have a major non-conformity. So we have two qualitative variables. The first variable is the business. The outcomes are A or B. And the second variable is the type of non-conformity. The outcome is none, minor, major. Okay. At the bottom of slide 16, you can see a two-way contingency table. So this two-way contingency table is showing us the data for the problem. So what we have are counts for each of the different categories. So for example, 347 of the circuit card assemblies from vendor A had no nonconformity. 88 um, of the circuit card assemblies from vendor B had minor nonconformities. 36 of the circuit card assemblies from vendor A had major nonconformities. Um, there was a total of 123 minor nonconformities. There was a total of 285 circuit card assemblies from vendor B and a total of 703 circuit card assemblies in the entire study. Okay, so just recapping how to read the two-way contingency table. But this hopefully will be familiar to you because we use these when we studied um, independence and other different types of probabilities back 
before the midterm. All right. So the goal of the chi-square independence test is to determine if variable A and variable B are related to each other. So the null hypothesis is basically that they are not related or that they are independent. And the alternative hypothesis is that they are related or not independent. So on slide 17, I have the null hypothesis written as type of nonconformity and vendor are not associated. Not associated, this is the same thing as being independent. So you can write it as type of nonconformity and vendor are independent, or you can write it as um, type of nonconformity and vendor are not associated. And again, this would be in the general case, variable A and variable B are independent or variable A and variable B are not associated. Okay, so it follows that are associated this would just, this could also be written as not independent. So again, with this test, we have a pretty standard set of null and alternative hypotheses. The null is again, just saying these things are independent and the alternative is saying they're not independent. That's pretty much all there is to it. This test is carried out in the exact same way as the goodness of fit test. The only differences are the null and alternative hypothesis and the degree of freedom calculation and the expected value calculation. So there's three differences, the null and the alternative, the degree of freedom calculation and the expected value calculation. Those are the only differences between the independence test and the goodness of fit test. Otherwise, they have the exact same assumptions and they have the exact same steps. All right. So for the independence test, the degrees of freedom are the number of rows minus one in the contingency table times the number of columns minus one from the contingency table. The expected value is the row total times the column total divided by the sample size. Okay. So this calculation is a little bit longer depend, and depending on the size of the contingency table can drag on quite a bit because if you have a really big table, you have to consider all the different row and column combinations. But it's still a fairly simple calculation in that you only need totals from each row and each column to work out the expected quantities. All right, so we're gonna go through an illustration of how to compute the expected quantities for the contingency table we are working with. Okay, first off, let's just write down a few facts. So for our contingency table, R is equal to three and C is equal to two. So we have three rows, one, two, three, and we have two columns, one, two. Okay, so this means that we have six, three times two equals six expected values. Okay. The degrees of freedom for this particular table is going to be R minus one, the number of rows minus one times the number of columns minus one, which is three minus one times two minus one, which is two times one, which is two. Inside the table on slide 21, I'm giving you the expected values for every outcome. 
So I'm going to show you how to calculate a few of these now. In row one, column one, our expected quantity would be found as follows. So we have E11 is going to be R times C over N. Okay, so the row total for column for row one is 537 multiplied by the column total for row one, which is 418, divided by the sample size for the total experiment, which is 703. That gives us three hundred and nineteen point two nine seven three. For row one, column two, we have row total times column total. So the row total is five hundred and thirty seven. The column total is now two eighty five. And we divide by the sample size, and that gives us 217.7027. All right, so that's two examples of how to compute the expected values. I'll give you one more just to make sure that it's clear. Okay, so this would be the expected value for row two, column one, which is R times C over N. So now the row total is 123 times the column total, which is 418, divided by the sample size, which is 703. And that gives us Right. So this is the same process we have to use to find all the expected values. You're matching row to column total, divide by sample size, and you just match throughout the table depending on where you are in the contingency table. Any questions? Okay, so once we finish the expected value calculations, for each observed quantity, we're going to have an expected value. Now, we can write these as two separate tables. So for example, this is my table of expected values from slide 21. And here is my table of observed values on slide 16. On slide 22, I have my observed and expected uh, quantities um, next to one another. So I'm just putting them together in this table to save space. But basically here, I have my observed quantities and here I have my expected, just to see how they match up. But the point is for each observed quantity, you have to have an expected quantity. And the expected quantity is found using the process from the previous slide, row total, row total times column total divided by sample size. All right. So just like before, we have um, our three assumptions. So the first assumption is that none of the expected values, well, maybe I only have one illustration. Sorry, one second. No, I have two. Okay, good. Okay, so the first um, assumption is that none of the expected values are less than one. Our lowest expected value is uh, 17.4323. So we're fine here. 
we have no expected values less than one. Our second assumption is that none of the expected val or no more than 20% of the expected values are less than five. We don't have a single expected value less than five, so we're good here. And then the third assumption is that we collected a simple random sample. We're told that we can, in the description of the problem, we can assume the data is an SRS, so we're fine here. For the null hypothesis, we are going to have that variable A and variable B are independent. So in our case, we're going to have the type of nonconformity and the vendor are independent. This is the same thing as being not associated. So the null hypothesis is that type of nonconformity and vendor are not associated. The alternative is going to be the type of nonconformity and vendor are associated. On step two, we have our significance level. On step three, we compute our test statistic. So we're just matching observed to expected and filling out the formula. So we're going to have um, 347 minus 319.2 Point two nine seven three squared divided by 319.2973 plus 190 minus 217.7027 squared divided by 217.7027 plus 35 minus 73.135 one four squared divided by 73.13514 plus 88 minus 49.86486 squared divided by 49.86486 plus 36 minus 26.8 five six seven five seven squared divided by twenty six point five six seven five seven plus seven minus seventeen point four three two four three squared divided by seventeen point four three two four three and that gives us a test statistic of 65.478. Any questions? You guys are alive, right? Someone tell me you're alive. Yes. Okay, good. Yes, it is a lot of writing, barely. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, it's concerning that you would write hanging on because it's the first part of the day. Is everything okay? Is it just stats or is it the whole process? I hope it's, it's probably the whole process. We're almost done. Next week is our last full week of lecture and then the week after is supposed to be review. So we're, we're actually very close to being finished with uh, lectures. It's kind of crazy. Hopefully we'll have time for review. I think we'll be okay. Um, I know it is crazy. Yeah, I can appreciate that. It's busy. Um, but you're gonna make it. I believe in you. How many lab quizzes are there? Four? Four in a final? Five in a final. Hmm. Yes, busy, very busy.
I know that NGL is not going to lie, but I don't know what LKR is. Like, I don't know language anymore. IKR. Oh, I know right. Okay, I got it. All right, let's finish this. And then we can do more abbreviation lessons. I teach you something, you teach me something. That's, this is exchange of knowledge. This is forward progress. Um, all right, so we have our test statistic. On step four, we can take either the critical value or the p-value approach. Okay, whoa, this is gonna work in the same way that it did before. Okay, so it's a chi-square test. So we're doing the right squared, or sorry, the right skewed distribution. The only difference now is our degree of freedom calculation, which I have summarized here, right? So for the chi-square test, the, for the chi-square independence test, the degrees of freedom are the number of rows in the contingency table, minus one, multiplied by the number of columns in the table, minus one. So we have three minus one times two minus one, which gives us two degrees of freedom. So we have a critical value on 0 0.05 and two, All right, so we go to our table. So we have two, 0 0.05, 5.991. All right, and then our test statistic is like 65 point something. It's like something insane, 65.478. Right, so we're as far, we're like right into that curve, so far into that curve tail, we're rejecting for sure. P value, we're gonna have our right skewed distribution. Okay, and then our test statistic is gonna be super far into that skewed tail very very large value so the p value is going to be very small just this little blip here okay so our p value is the probability that a chi square it exceeds 65.478 so since the probability a chi square exceeds 65.478 we go to our chi square table we have two degrees of freedom. We can see that the test statistic is much bigger than the largest listed value, right? So our P value is gonna be smaller than the smallest listed tail value. So therefore, since this is less than 0 0.05, then the p-value is less than 0 Okay, so based off either approach, we're going to reject, right? So the p-value is less than the significance level, we can reject. The test statistic is much larger than the critical value, so we can reject. So therefore, the data provides sufficient evidence to suggest that type of nonconformity and the vendor are related to what, one another. So they're not independent of one another. you'll be able to finish it. 
You can already start it. Okay, any other questions? Oof. That's mean. Yeah, you'll be able to finish it. You can finish it right now. We've covered everything you need for it. But that number five question, that is cruel. <laughs> it's long. All right, let's do, I want to do one more um, independence test example. Uh, so we're going to just do a full exercise of the chi-square independence test now from start to finish. Uh, and then we'll have all of lecture set 10 completed. You can already finish um, lecture set or assignment number five because we've already covered the independence test. But this is just to kind of, you know, further reinforce how it works. All right. So in this exercise, we have in a study to determine the effect of azorbic acid, aka vitamin C, on the common cold, an experiment on 279 people was carried out. The results are given in the table below. At the 5% significance level, do the data provide sufficient evidence that the effect of azorbic acid and the common cold are related? So we just want to know, is getting the cold related to or associated with taking vitamin C? So the first thing we're going to do is work out the expected values because we need the expected values to do all of our different calculations. Okay, so <clears throat> Okay, so our first expected value is going to be row total times column total divided by the sample size. So I have 48 times 140 divided by 279. And this should be in the area of 24.08602. Our second expected value is going to be 48 times 139 divided by 279, which is 23.91398. Our third expected value will be 231 times 140 divided by 279 which is 115.91398. Our fourth expected value is going to be 231 times 139 divided by 279, which is 115.0. 
All right. So now we can do the assumptions of the test. The first assumption is that no expected values are less than one. So this is going to be verified since smallest expected value is 23.91398. Our second assumption will be verified. So the second assumption is that no more than 20% of the expected values are less than five. This again is verified because we don't have a single expected value less than five. So we can write, for example, no expected values less than five. And then our third assumption is that we collected a simple random sample. Um, no direct evidence of this. It says in a study, an experiment, maybe we can maybe assume that they conducted the study in, in a, an efficient way. But let's say here, we're not sure. And we'll just accommodate for it later. OK, so now we can actually go through the test. All right, so on step one, we're going to have H0 um, the effect of azorbic acid in the common cold. The effect of azorbic acid and the common cold are not associated versus HA, the effect of azorbic acid and the common cold are associated. Okay. Step two, we declare the significance level, which is 0 0.05. And then on step three, we have our test statistic, which is the sum of observed minus expected squared over expected. All right, so we are going to have 31 minus 20. 4.08602 squared plus 17 minus 23.91398 squared. Oh, divided by 24.08602 divided by 23.91398 plus um 109 109 minus 115.91398 squared divided by 115.91398 plus 122 minus 115.91398 Zero eight six zero two divided by one hundred and fifteen point zero eight six zero two, which is equal to a number four point eight one one. All 
Moment. Okay, so all we have left to do now is determine if the test statistic is going to warrant rejection of the null or if it is not going to warrant rejection of the null. So we can take the critical value approach or we can take the p-value approach. If we take our critical value approach, we sketch our curve, right skewed curve. Right. So we have a chi-square on 0 0.05. The degrees of freedom is going to be the number of rows minus 1 times the number of columns minus 1. Okay. So this is going to be 2 minus 1 times 2 minus 1 because our contingency table has two rows and two columns. Okay, so that's just gonna be one. So we have a chi-square on 0 0.05 and one. So we go to our table, we match 0 0.05 to one, that gives us 3.841. Okay, and our test statistic was 4.811. Nah. So clearly we're inside the rejection region, so we can reject. All right, and then in this example, we write down our test statistic. Okay, so our p-value is going to be the area to the right of our test statistic. So we have p value is equal to the probability that a chi square exceeds 4.811. So since, and then we would go to our table, we have one degree of freedom. We can see that 4.811 is in between zero or is in between 3.841 and 5.024. Okay, so therefore our p-value is going to be between 0 0.05 and 0 0.025. So since 0 0.025 is less than the probability that a chi-square exceeds 4.811 is less than 0 0.05, then 0 0.025 is less than the p-value is less than 0 0.05. And then on step five, we reject H naught. And on step six, we can say, if the SRS assumption can be verified, then the data provide sufficient evidence to suggest that the effect of azorbic acid and the common cold are associated at the 
five percent significance level. All right. Not bad. I'll let it breathe for a second. Okay, so with that, we are officially done lecture set number 10. And actually what's kind of cool is according to the course outline, we are now um, on track with what is written. So on Thursday, we're gonna do lecture set 11, which is One Way Innova. Um, we'll probably finish it. It's a pretty quick lecture set. And then, on, uh, and then next week, we're gonna study regression analysis, which is lecture set number 12. Okay, so we're kind of back on pace with what was set out at the start of the course, which is nice because we're getting close to the end. So it's, it's good we're not rushing. Um, you can finish lecture set five. Lecture set five covers lecture sets nine and 10. So lecture assignment number five is lecture sets nine and 10, which is um, two sample hypothesis testing and both kinds of chi-square tests. Um, uh, there's two more assignments. So assignment five is due next week. And then the week after is assignment six, which is kind of like a half assignment. It's a short one only on regression and maybe some ANOVA. There's two assignments left, assignment five, assignment six. There is one lab quiz left, which is lab quiz number five. And then in the last week you have the lab final, which is, um 8 p.m on december 7th to 8 p.m on december 8th so it's a 90 minute lab exam which will be held i think is run in the same way as the lab quizzes actually i'm like i'm very sure that's true and you have 24 hours to finish it so it has to be finished by the end of the semester which is uh wednesday is the very last day Okay, so again, you can finish assignment five, which is due next Tuesday. So you have a full week in which you can get that done. Um, and then we're gonna start lecture set 11 on Thursday, hopefully finish that on Thursday. And then on uh, next week, we're gonna do lecture set 12, which is the last lecture set of new material. And then the last week uh, we can do review basically. Um, I believe the lab exam, just give me a second. I believe it's 15 questions. I'll, let me see if I can get an exact number. My guess though is that Kathleen or Dr. Laura Lowry Batty, Kathleen, <laughs> she will uh, she'll send out like a very detailed email. Um, that, okay, here we go. A very detailed email with all the question numbers and all that kind of stuff. Let me see if I can. Sorry, I keep clicking the wrong thing. Sixteen. Sixteen questions.
Um, the class final. It's something like that. Yeah, let me here. I'll confirm it right now. It's in. Um, it should be in your student system. Did I write it in the course outline? Yeah, December Thursday, December sixteenth, from nine to noon, and I believe that that's exactly the same for both. Yeah, that's the same for both sections. So there's not going to be any of the. You're in this section, you write at this time, you're in this section, you write at this time. It's all just everybody writes at the same time on the Thursday. Uh, did I miss any questions? I don't think so. All right, guys. So I will talk to you on Thursday morning. I have office hours today. And uh, yeah, you know, gate. Stuff done. Try and sleep. Eat food. All that stuff. Bye-bye.